Uh, so this is a little agenda of what we're planning to cover today. We're going to talk about readings, lectures, tutorials, essays, and exams that are all components of the foundation year program. We're also going to talk about how that program is going to look in online delivery. And we also want to talk about what happens beyond FIP. So in the electives that you take alongside FIP, in the years that you spend at King's and Dalhousie after foundation year program. And then we're going to open it up to a Q&A. And if you're not familiar with these Zoom webinars, I bet all of you have done a million of these already. But if you're not familiar with them, um, if you just put your finger over your screen, you'll see a button that says Q&A. And that's an easy way to type in a question for us to see uh, when we get to the Q&A section. And the people who you'll hear from today, um, my name is Yolana Wasersag. Many of you have talked to me by email or over the phone already, uh, but if you haven't, hello, nice to meet you. I am Assistant Registrar Student Recruitment at King's, and I'll let my co-presenters uh, also pipe up and say hello so you hear their voices. Neil, do you wanna start? Oh, unmute your mic. Sorry about that, I'm not very expert at this. Uh, I'm Neil Robertson. I'm the director of the Foundation Year Program, and uh, I have also was at one point a student in the Foundation Year Program, so I know a little bit about where you may be coming from. And Patricia, do you want to say hi? Wonderful, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Patricia Laws. I am the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs in the Faculty of Science. Um, my role is to work with students in supporting them and making academic decisions and doing academic planning. And so it's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you a little bit about um, our, my, my home faculty, which is Dow Science. Perfect. So Neil, I'm going to turn things over to you for uh, the next part of this presentation. Uh, thank you, Yolanda. Um, so uh, welcome everybody to this uh, and uh, this is our first go at least my first go at a webinar like this uh, so hopefully things will go reasonably smoothly I want to just say a few things about uh, the foundation program that you may already be familiar with to outline things and then uh, towards the end talk a little bit how about how we're going to uh, modify the program in terms of the online component so uh, as your probably knowledgeable of, but let me just uh, go through it so that we're on a common page here. Uh, the Foundation Year Program is in a way has three kinds of uh, education that belong to it. And we're gonna go through each of those three moments or three forms of learning. The first one is that we read books and we read books together. Uh, and you can see here, these are just some selected readings uh, from the Foundation Program. We have six sections. Uh, and the sections are structured chronologically. So we're going on a kind of journey or odyssey, uh, and that journey or odyssey moves us from the ancient world, from the most uh, ancient uh, city that we know of in, uh, in Sumer, the city of Ur, uh, and um, we read there some of the foundational texts of Sumerian civilization, particularly the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, and then move through a series of readings uh, to our own contemporary world. And in a way, the whole point of the Foundation Year Program is to give us a kind of insight into the world we live in right now. Uh, but the sense is that we can only really understand the world that we live in now. Some of the issues that uh, Yolanda brought up uh, earlier in her introduction, those are issues that have a deep history to them. And we can only come to understand the issues that we're facing by looking at a longer trajectory. Uh, and one of the goals we have is to try not just to read about various periods in this history, but to actually enter into it by having the chance to read these texts, which have been selected by the coordinators of the six sections. Each section has a coordinator. By the coordinator of each section, they're meant to be ways into some important standpoint that belongs to that period. So we're reading works of literature, we're reading works of philosophy, science, uh, art, uh, politics, history, uh, all of those things are part of what we'll be covering. And uh, one of the, uh, these are works that are inherently rich and multifaceted. Uh, I have been studying them for my entire life since I started the Foundation Program just a few years ago. 
uh, and they are rich and every year students bring new insights and new understandings. And one of the important things is that we're doing them together. Um, and uh, the way that we begin this is, Yolanda, if we could move to the uh, next slide, is that we begin in a sense our uh, consideration of what we've read. Uh, so each evening or each uh, afternoon, uh, you have a chance or more, you know, in your spare time to do those readings. Uh, but then what will be, uh, you'll have an opportunity is to engage in those readings through a lecturer. And the task of the lecturer is to try to not be the final word on what you're considering, but really just a kind of first word, a way in. Uh, and one of the great pleasures of the Foundation Year program is that we are able to um, uh, look at things from a number of uh, different perspectives and doing them together. And each lecturer is going to bring their own insight and perspective. And really what they are, are people who have read these works and perhaps loved these works, or at least thought a great deal about them, and can provide us all with a kind of way of thinking about that text. Um, and uh, when we take a look at some of those, let me just, could we just go back actually now, Yolana? I'm, I'm out of control here, I'm sorry. Uh, if we look at the variety of texts we're looking at, we have works of literature and philosophy. We have works that are coming to us primarily from the Western tradition, but we're also looking at that development, which is really what leads to the modern world uh, in terms of science and technology and a secular world. All of those arise out of this development. But we're also looking at it in relationship to other civilizations. And one of the ways we can do that is in terms of the encounters that happen. Uh, and so you'll see here a number of texts that are considering these issues of the encounter uh, between uh, the developments that are happening uh, in the European context and then the way that these influence, affect, and are in turn affected by uh, other peoples and other uh, contexts. Uh, so when we're looking at this history, it's by no means just a question of um, uh, a kind of raw, raw, or a consideration of a kind of single civilization. It's rather about the interplay and interconnection. And we look at both what is destructive as well as what is constructive in this development, both the suffering and pain and also the sense of progress and development. And of course, even in our contemporary world, these opposing moments are there at every point uh, in uh, the developments of technology and uh, governance can simultaneously have good and bad consequences. And uh, we get a chance to think about all of those things together. Um, so after the lectures, uh, we move on to what I view as a kind of Part of the Foundation Year program. And you can see it here on the screen, uh, the tutorial. Uh, and normally, and I'll talk about, about this uh, when we get along later, normally I would say the tutorials are no larger than 15 students. We're going to be modifying that uh, this year. Uh, but they're the opportunity that you have. You've read the text, you've had a top opportunity to think about the lecture and the insights that lecture has given you. And now you may have all sorts of questions. There may be things you're not you know, being able to put together. There also may be things that you're disagreeing with about the text itself and about the lecture that you heard. Maybe the lecturer was saying things that you didn't think were appropriate or right. One of the great things about FIP, one of the things I love about it, is that its pedagogical principle is one of a fundamental equality between everybody that's in the program. So what I often say is the only difference between me and any first year student taking the foundation program is that, as you can see, I probably have a bit less hair. I've been around a little bit longer. I've read these a few more times. But all of us have the same body of evidence. 
we're all working with the same primary material. So I am not emerging as an expert over against somebody who is simply passively receiving information. We're all engaged in constructing in a conversation and in discussion and debate how to enter into and understand what's going on in that text. And doing so in a respectful, thoughtful, and open fashion in which different voices are going to have an opportunity to inform our thinking together. So the tutorial to my mind is the place where in a way we've been building everything up for that to really happen. And the tutors that we have in the foundation program are exceptional. They're not uh, graduate students doing uh, their teaching uh, on a part-time basis. These are full-time academics. Uh, some are uh, more junior, they're the fellows, and some are more senior, the professors. But all of us are engaged in this program on a full-time basis with your full attention. And uh, the tutorial is going to be, I think, the way in which you'll be uh, particularly tied into and connected to the program, uh, especially in this year. Um, uh, it'll be the moment where we'll have a kind of living contact with uh, one another. Um, and in a way, we could now move on to the next slide, if, if you don't mind. We could talk a little bit about these are the ways, essays and exams, that of course you're going to most primarily be graded. But I don't want you to think about essays and exams primarily in terms of judgment or a kind of um, registering of what you know. They are actually themselves kind of the prime places where you can crystallize the learning that you have engaged in. And so the essay, we're gonna have an essay every two weeks. Uh, the essay becomes a place in which your deliberations that have begun perhaps in tutorial are now going to take on the form of a thoughtful argument by which you explore your understanding of a text and defend your understanding. And just to give you a sense of, you might say, the uh, way in which we're not going to tell you how to think uh, about these things, you're gonna have to make up your own mind. We don't actually even have essay questions. They get called essay questions, but all they are are quotations from the text. Okay, they've been carefully selected quotations and then the word discuss. And so it's gonna be really up to you to formulate your own question and use that to explore and understand the text and develop an argument about it. Now that's not something that you're gonna be able to do absolutely perfectly from the start. So in a way we think about this as a kind of apprenticeship. You're gonna be doing the same thing 12 times in, over the course of the year. And over that period of time, your skills will develop in terms of interpretation and insight into a text, understanding it, and at the same time, having a capacity to articulate your thoughts and present them in a coherent fashion with evidence and uh, compelling connections. So that sense of framing an argument is something that you're going to learn to do over the course of this entire year. And let me just assure you that when you go on into your classes uh, at Dalhousie uh, in any field whatsoever, this capacity is going to serve you extremely well and on into whatever future career you may have. We all have to make evidence-based arguments no matter what we're doing. Um, and the other aspects of how we, uh, you might say, register how you're performing in the foundation program are through a midterm exam, uh, which is usually a kind of short answer type of exam, uh, which is uh, done in the middle of the, each term. Uh, and they're fairly straightforward and you're not dissimilar to what you already have experienced in your high school education, uh, probably various kinds of short uh, uh, answer questions uh, that are really just meant to um, 
give you an opportunity to demonstrate how widely you have been reading and keeping up with the material in the program. And then a very unusual kind of examination at the end of the year, at the end of each term, the oral examination. And that, again, is another opportunity for you to have a conversation uh, with faculty. Uh, there'll be two who will be talking with you, uh, really about what you've learned and the ideas you have discovered uh, in relationship to the material that has been covered. So that gives you a kind of sense of things, and we have all sorts of ways to support you in all of this work. Uh, there is, uh, as this um, slide is showing, a consistent schedule of essays, so you're gonna know when each one is done. You're not gonna, you're not gonna have to be juggling among them. You're gonna be developing your skills. We have a writing coach uh, who is there to support you. Uh, beyond the support you're already going to have available through your tutor. Uh, and uh, all of that is there to help you succeed in the foundation of your program. So now I just want to talk a little bit about how things are different this year. Uh, and um, we are going on the basis that at least for the first term, and perhaps as well for the second term, but uh, maybe life will uh, break happily for us, but uh, at least for the first term, we're going to have to be online in terms of how we are um, doing the foundation program this year. And we're viewing this as uh, a challenge, uh, but also as a kind of opportunity of doing things just a little bit differently. Uh, and uh, we already had a little bit of experience with this at the end of the last academic year for the group of students who did foundation program last year. Uh, we're going to be building on that and at the same time um, uh, raising it to a higher level. So we're going to be providing you with uh, recorded, uh, pre-recorded, pre pre-done lectures that each of the um, lecturers will be preparing for you. The two, so they're going to be what is called asynchronous, which means that it, they're not going to be dependent upon the um, uh, everybody being at the same time. Uh, and then we're going to also have tutorials. Uh, they're also going to be done uh, online. Uh, but in order to make them work, we have come to the view that we need to actually cut them in half in terms of the numbers, uh, at least for the first term. And that is going to mean that there'll have be eight student tutorials, uh, not 15 student tutorials, to allow for greater uh, possibility of making those kind of connections uh, in this much more difficult uh, uh, medium when we're not kind of face to face to ensure that everybody has a chance to participate. Uh, and um, so we'll be doing those eight person tutorials, but they're going to be synchronous. That means is they're gonna be scheduled and you will have to, I'm afraid, sort out relative to your time zone uh, uh, when you're meeting with everybody uh, but we'll be setting all those tutorials up. All this is going to be made very clear and straightforward. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and we have a lot of confidence that that's going to be really the heart of the program this year. Uh, and for though, if we are making changes uh, in the course of the um, year, uh, one thing you can rest assured of, which is that this online option, uh, irrespective of whether we have some capacity to have students uh, come onto campus, uh, this online option will be available throughout the entire year. So um, that probably uh, is at least a pretty good um, uh, oversight of the things I had wanted to talk about in this webinar. Um, but uh, I know that we're going to have an opportunity uh, later on to have a question and answer. So. I'm going to send things over to Yelena and to Patricia Laws. Great. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, I just want to address for all of you who signed up for this webinar, this is for our FIPS science students. So um, everything that Neil was just describing about lectures and tutorials and readings, those make up three days of your week or the equivalent of three classes out of a full course load of five. Um, and for science students, there is all the stuff that you do alongside FIP and also in the years beyond FIP uh, in second, third, and fourth year within the Faculty of Science. So this is where I wanted to turn it over to Dr. Laws 
um, to talk a little bit more about where science fits in with FIP and what happens for the rest of uh, the rest of the time that you're in the Faculty of Science. I'll uh, leave it with you, Patricia. Thank you so much. I love this picture because I think that it really shows the unique collaboration, um, both physically, uh, the connection that Dalhousie and Kings has, but also gives you a sense that um, students have an, oppor an excellent opportunity um, to, to really experience both that, that King's atmosphere and that, that outstanding learning experience um, that, that you just spoke of in FIP, but also to have that opportunity to, to go beyond um, the, the, the FIP programming um, and, and explore an area of interest that you have within science. And so um, maybe what I'll do, uh, and as you're looking at this image on the, on the screen, I just want to share with you that some of the, the prevalent buildings that you're looking at um, to, the, to the left of the King's campus is actually our, our Dunn building, our physics building, our math building, I can see our chemistry building, and also my, my home is our life science building, which is in the far right hand corner hiding behind your faces. Um, so it's, it's really neat to see that, that strong uh, science connection from this image. It was a really cool picture for me to see as I was uh, looking at the slide deck. Um, maybe what I'll do is just tell you all a little bit more about science about who we are. Um, and so if you could advance to the next slide. Um, in Dell Science, we are the largest faculty at Dalhousie University. We have over 18 different programs. And I'll talk to you very briefly. I'm not going to get into um, talking about each and every one of the programs that we offer. But I want you to, to have a sense of the diversity of programming that we do have within the Faculty of Science. We have over 4,000 students within our faculty. Um, and over 200 faculty members delivering programming and doing research um, in a variety of areas of science. Um, so I'll just get you to move to the next slide and we'll talk again, as I said, not, um, not at length about the different types of programs, but I want to give you some, some sense of the, the diversity of programming that we offer within science. First of all, um, th there are those, those subjects that you um, would expect to see. Some of you are probably finishing up some of these subjects in high school. Maybe you've really enjoyed them and are looking to expand on that, that knowledge or get some more exposure to that knowledge. And so there's, you can see the biology, the chemistry, the physics, um, the math pieces. But we also have some very unique programming to uh, Dalhousie which is our, our ocean sciences programming and our marine biology, really um, going off the fact that we are um, on, on the ocean in Nova Scotia and really have that unique connection um, with the programming that we offer. Um, as well, we have a really strong uh, background in terms of health science type programming, looking at our biochemistry, our microbiology and immunology, and um, psychology and neuroscience as well. And, and just to sort of round that out and really take you to the other, the other uh, end of that spectrum, we also have um, really strong foundations in economics and actuarial science. So looking at that science behind the economy and, and science behind risk. Um, so there's a, a, a broad range of options for students to explore. Um, I would encourage you uh, to look to see what are those areas that you're the most interested in and really try to explore those and get a sense of where, where you might want to take your science degree to take you. Um, with, uh, with FIP Science, uh, as Yolanda had mentioned, really there is, uh, there's two openings, um, I believe, if you're going to take a, a course load of five classes for science courses. And so really looking to strategically ensure that you're taking classes that you like, that you enjoy and are passionate about and wanted to learn more about. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that might look like um, as I go through the next couple of slides. So first and foremost, um, I want to acknowledge that at Dell, um, it is our intention to provide students with the ideal scientific training to achieve their ambition. And under non-COVID circumstances, whenever I give a presentation, you're going to see me showing lots of engagement and face-to-face -face interactions. Science is very much a hands-on field where students are out in the field in our earth and environmental sciences and our ocean sciences and marine biology program collecting data, going on field uh, excursions throughout Nova Scotia and then beyond. Um, 
Also, we have uh, students in the labs doing that traditional form of chemistry, as, as you can see in our central image here, where we have an instructor demonstrating um, a technique and then students going off and, and practicing that technique uh, on their own within our lab setting. Um, and then you, you see in the third image where we have um, our first year biology coordinator, Todd Bishop, really working, and engage, working to engage with students and getting to know them and to support them in their learning. And, and I want to say to you, because I think it's really important that we put out there that we have every intention when it is safe for us to do so, to return to that face-to-face -face interaction. These hands-on interactions are fundamental uh, to your learning experience and, and we want to return to that. But in the meantime, what we're doing is really trying to make the best of uh, this opportunity and develop some programming that allows us to go a bit beyond um, where, where we might have been thinking had we just been hitting that, uh, you know, play as usual button uh, for the fall of 2020. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what that might look like. And, and I want to give you some reassurances. So the first thing um, that I want to talk to you about is the fact that, and I'm sure all of you are wondering right now, thinking about first year science and what are your first year science courses going to look like for you? I want to reassure you that we have a, a solid team of first year course, uh, course instructors and, and professors who come together and work together to try and ensure the best possible first year science experience for students. And so they're actually actively engaging in learning from each other and talking about strategies and how they're going to deliver their course. What are the uh, synchronous components, meaning the components where classes might come together or small groups of classes would come together? Or that asynchronous component where you can be watching a lecture at a time that is right for you and that suits your, um, your living arrangements and your plans. Um, I also want to reassure each and every one of you that we have been delivering online programming for a while now in the Faculty of Science. Uh, we have a number of online courses like online biology that have been delivered for years. And so these, these experts in the online delivery are really working to support our course instructors who uh, don't have a foundation in online learning to build them up, to identify what are those best practices, what works best for students, and how can we really work um, to ensure that students get the best possible uh, learning experience. I'm really proud of uh, the first year science community that we have. Um, I know that one, we, we have meetings on a regular basis where we come together and talk. And one of the major themes that came out of, the, uh, of our conversations was how do we go about building community with our students? How do we really find a way to connect and give students that opportunity to get that same connection that they would have in a lab or in a classroom or that after the, after the lecture uh, talk that is so special for, for many students where they actually pop down and have a conversation with their professor right after a lecture. And so they're actively trying to find different ways to be able to do that in a way that's in a mechanism that's right for their class and their discipline. So there's lots of, lots of really exciting things coming um, in terms of the method of delivery of the courses. And, and I, I have um, a lot of pride in, in, our, in our course instructors. The thing that I, I think that we also have to keep in mind um, is just looking at how, and, and, and you, you had referred this, to this briefly, uh, Dr. Robertson, when you talked about the switch that was made in March. And so I thought what I would, would do is sort of, you know, recognizing that we already have a foundation in online learning for many of our uh, first year science courses, I thought I would also take a moment to talk to you about how we made that switch and just to give you some perspective on some of the things that we, we felt was important to the learning environment. And I use that royal we, it was really um, our course instructors who were delivering the courses in March. So if we can just go to the next slide for a moment. Um, one of the things that the first year uh, committee talked about when we found out that we were going to have to make the switch was the importance of those relationships and connections that they had made with their students and really not wanting to lose that. 
And so the, the course instructors worked um, very hard to ensure that there were recorded lectures that was, pair, that was paired with the course material, um, that there was active lab um, experiments that students could engage in through a video format, um, but also ensuring that there was a space for students to connect with their teaching assistants. Those people who had been there with them throughout the semester in first year chemistry, for example, often that class is taken as a fall version, a fall semester, and then students follow up with the winter semester. And so many of those students had been with their course instructor for a year um, and had built those relationships. And so this image that I show you is it was um, the first year chemistry team recognizing that they wanted a way to say good luck on your exams. They wanted a way to say, how, you know, we miss you, stay safe. Um, and so they put together a, a montage of all of the, the team really working and trying to find a way to connect. So each and every one of the TAs had an opportunity to say goodbye and good luck um, to their students. And so I thought that was a really powerful message because it actually means that they cared. And I also want to point out that the top two images are actually the course instructors um, for the course. They really also work, um, in particular, Angela Crane and Jennifer McDonald work to have fun while they're learning chemistry. Um, and I am confident uh, that this dynamic duo will be uh, making every effort to, to continue that along um, in their online experience. They're currently in the, in the process of developing uh, the online versions of those courses right now. Um, I'm just going to get you to advance to the next slide. When I do presentations like this, I always want to be very cautious. Um, I'm not trying to sell you on something. I think that it's really important for you, um, each and every individual one of you out there, um, to think about what is the best learning experience for you? And what is that, what feels right for you? What is that best possible experience? And so I'm very aware that I can tell you that it's gonna be the best possible experience, but I think that it's important for you to hear from a student. Um, so this is a, a first year science student who um, is talking about the experience um, of um, switching to online, um, online learning and talking about the experiences of being in an online class. The, um, the fact that she really enjoyed the flexibility um, with her schedule, but cautioning that she recognized that it's really important when, you're getting, when you are getting ready to start in September with us in this brand new first year experience that you need to, to, to connect with us through our virtual office hours, connect with those who are, who are running your tutorials or delivering your lab sections. Take that time to really reach out so that you can start to build that strong foundation. And then when you, when you are walking on our campuses, um, whenever that is safe and we're allowed to do so, you're already going to have friends there. You're already going to know people. And, and it's going to be such an amazing experience to be able to make that connection um, when, when, you, when you start to see each other in three dimensions uh, when we're allowed to do so again. Um, so I'm, I'm leaving it, I'll, I'll leave it with our, one of our first year science students um, and turn it back over to you folks. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, what I'd love to do now is just open it up for all of your questions out there. Um, we've got, it's, hang, I, we've got plenty of time um, to answer questions for as long as you want. So you can hit the Q&A button um, there and type in a question. Um, I always like to say that if, you, if you're feeling a little shy today about typing in a question and you just want to email later with your question, that's totally okay too. But I'm willing to bet that if you're thinking of a question right now, that probably means that someone else is also thinking of the same thing uh, and is just desperate to hear the answer. So take the plunge. Um, perfect. So I've got one person in the Q&A section, section box who just said hello. Hello to you as well. Um, and uh, we definitely have lots of time, so don't feel, um, don't feel nervous about, you know, asking a question if you'd like to. Uh, and I'll also make sure that my email address is up. Okay, perfect. So uh, there's a question here, um, Patricia, I think this one, you'd be the best to answer this, which is how do labs work when people are learning from home? Um, can you, yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. So I can't speak to what each and every program is going to do. Um, I think that what we, but I can talk to what 
talk about what we are, what we have talked about and what first year biology has, has done. And so one of the things that we, um, we talked about in the first year science committee was really the fact that we need to look at what are the key pieces of information? What are the key outcomes that we want students to know from our course? And then we have to find creative ways to allow ourselves to accomplish that. Um, some of it can be through video interactions where a particular experiment happens they, they, and it's recorded so that students can get that visual observation of how it's happening. And then they're interacting with answering questions and collecting data throughout that process. Others really look at trying to come at, uh, the, at the experiment or at the outcome from a different perspective. And so I think that I think that I don't, I don't have a concrete answer to say this is exactly how it's going to happen, but if I can be really frank, that's no different than if we were to do face-to-face -face labs, because each and every one of our labs has a different approach to the experimental um, design and experimental method. So I, I do know that there's a lot of discussion in terms of trying to ensure that students have that same opportunity to visualize the experience and ex visualize the experiment as it happens. So I suspect there's going to be lots of recording. Um, I know course instructors will have access to our buildings when it's safe to do those recordings in our in our labs. And so they can actually be performing those experiments so students can engage in that way. Another question that we have here is what is the difference in FIP essay requirements for art students as compared to science students? Okay, I guess that's for me. Yeah. Um, so uh, the science students are doing three out of the four regular, three quarters of the uh, requirements of the um, uh, art students. Uh, that in the, in the essays, that works out slightly differently. Uh, so it, you're doing 10 essays rather than 12 essays. Uh, and uh, that has to do really uh, with ensuring that everybody's doing uh, that first essay uh, on the same basis. Uh, there are some other slight variations about due dates uh, that uh, there's a, a little bit more allowance uh, on a couple of occasions for the science students, uh, particularly at the end of the term, uh, because that allows for flexibility about uh, the obligations on, uh, on the science side of things. Um, but essentially, that's, um, uh, there's your, attending uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and not on Thursday. You're not responsible for the Thursday material, and, uh, and there's that reduction in, uh, in the essay requirements. Uh, so I guess that's the, the, the basic thing. Perfect. Um, let, oh, go ahead. Just, there, there are two things that I thought of when uh, Patricia was speaking that I just wanted to mention, uh, and I didn't make clear in my own presentation, uh, one is that uh, in our tutorial system, you're going to be with the same group of students throughout the year. Uh, what will be changing is that you'll have a main tutor who will be in connection with you throughout the year and cover three out of our six sections and tutorials. And then you'll have a different tutor in the other three sections. So that's a kind of opportunity for a variety of experiences with an overarching person there to connect with you. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the tutors uh, will all also be offering office hours uh, when you'll have an opportunity to connect with them. Uh, and of course, connect with them uh, through email and other means as well. So there's been lots of time for individual support. So I just wanted to get those things in there as well. Thanks. Uh, there's actually uh, another question here that's related to tutorials, um, which is uh, if the tutorial time slots, the regular times are in, will be the same as the current times we have listed in our academic timetable, or if those might be changed before students register for courses. Uh, Neil, is that something that you can speak to? I don't totally know the answer to that. I'd be pretty confident that those time slots will be available. The only question is whether some alternative times uh, are going to be thought about. Uh, and this, of course, has to do with the fact that people are in different time zones. Um, so uh, I don't know the total answer to that at this uh, at, at this stage of things. Uh, but um, certainly those times will be available. The only question is whether there'll be some additional opportunities. 
Thank you. Um, there's a question here about from a student who's interested in pursuing engineering at Dalhousie after doing FIP and is asking uh, which first year math or science courses would be a good recommendation for someone that's pursuing engineering as a pathway. Um, and I just wanted to mention that, you know, Patricia, you can of course speak to this, but also this is a great question for any of our academic advisors. And just as a, a reminder to all of you, uh, you can make an appointment with an academic advisor at King's um, who can also direct you to an academic advisor from a specific uh, academic department if you want to be put in touch with an academic advisor from a specific department. And the way to reach our advisors is by emailing registrar at ukings.ca. But um, Patricia, do you have anything you want to add to specific advice for someone going into engineering? I, I definitely, so I definitely think that um, what I, I would recommend is to focus on physics and chemistry over the math. Um, engineering has a specific set series of math courses that they would want you to take. And I don't, I don't know, um, they're, they're specific for engineering students. And so I don't know if enrollment is restricted. I think it would be important to talk to an advisor and, and, and identify, you know, what, what is the appropriate um, path forward. But the, I do know that in particular with chemistry and physics, our engineering students take those exact classes. So the, there's, there's a chem, an engineering chemistry class or general chemistry class. It doesn't matter which section you sign up for. Our, engin, our department of or faculty of engineering accepts both. Um, and then there's a specific uh, physics class that students can take. I would strongly advise that any student out there who's looking at doing some programming, if you have any questions, connect with an academic advisor. This is a professional group of individuals who know our programs inside and out and who are able to connect with um, folks if there are questions that they may not be able to answer. So I, I really think rather than making the challenge of planning which classes to take, rather than looking at that as a big hurdle, look at it as an opportunity to get to know your first person at uh, Kings and Dow. There are some other questions in the chat box, I'm actually two that are very similar. One person asked, will your tutorial group in FIP only be made up of other science students? And another person asked um, if the, the tutorial groups are made up uh, of a mix of students from all different programs. So um, Neil, would you like to speak to that? Sure, uh, the answer is they're made up of a mix of all different uh, students uh, from different programs. So. Uh, usually there's just one or two uh, other science students in any given tutorial. Um, and uh, so that's an opportunity for people to connect and get to know people from different backgrounds. Uh, so it, it tends to enrich the whole tutorial experience. Absolutely. Um, there's a question here from a student who wants to know if lectures are pre-recorded, will science students have the opportunity to access all four of the FIP lectures in a week, as opposed to just the three that would normally be uh, available to science students? That's a great question. Sure. Uh, and this is one of those. Uh, so of course, uh, in a way, just as if you were on campus, um, you'd be have access to all the lectures uh, and um, even the ones you're not actually responsible for. So um, just as our, a number of science students come in uh, to a lecture on a Thursday uh, because they're interested in the material. Uh, so you can, you can do all of that and uh, more power to you. Yeah. Um, there's a student who wants to know when we will know what the FIP schedule is in order to have that information so they can register for other courses. So uh, yeah, go ahead. So I'm just a little bit unclear about what is meant about the FIP schedule there. Um, so in terms of the, the, the general shape uh, of the pro there, there's going to be a reading list sent out that will uh, give you a sense of what our, uh, our readings are going to be. The schedule is uh, that the lectures, at least in the first term, are going to be uh, sent as um, pre-recorded for you to be able to uh, look at, uh, as uh, Patricia was mentioning, uh, at your convenience. Uh, so the only thing that you're going to be scheduled to do in a time of synchronous sense is going to be the um, uh, is going to be the uh, tutorials in the second term. Uh, if we're back in person, then the back in person portion will be available from 9:30 to 11:30, uh, 
Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday morning for the lectures uh, with the tutorial times uh, as they're already uh, in existence. And uh, of course, though, anybody who's doing it online will still have that opportunity to select their own time for looking at the lectures. So there's actually more flexibility this year than there's ever been uh, in terms of uh, scheduling. It might also help um, to clarify. So sometimes when students enroll for FIP, because, because FIP is a unified program um, that has this very cohesive structure, often students who are planning to do this program think that they don't actually have to register for it. But course registration for first year students will open on the 15th of June. Um, and on that date, uh, all of the, the entire academic timetable for all of the programs at Kings and Dow becomes available for first year students, for incoming students to see. Uh, and you do actually actively register for FIP um, and select the tutorial time that works for you. Uh, at the same time as you're registering for the other classes that you would take alongside FIP, so your math or science classes. Um, and you'll be able to see how your timetable is coming together. Uh, but you, as Dr. Robertson said, you will have more flexibility because so many of these lectures will be things that you'll access at whatever time works for you. Um, but I hope that answered that question. So if the person who was asking about it is, uh, wants to follow up, if we didn't quite hit the nail on the head with what you were trying to ask, then feel free to type in a little clarifying note for me so that I can get it right. Um, and then there was another question in the Q&A box uh, from someone asking, for science students, are you allowed to take both a math class and a science class, or do you have to take two sciences? I'll, I guess I'll take that one. Sure. Um, so math is um, math is considered to be one of the science subjects. So you most definitely can take a math and a biology, or you can take uh, biology and chemistry. It's in order to graduate with a science degree, you do have to have two math classes. Um, so it's part of the degree requirements. And so we do encourage students to take that in their first year, especially if they've just completed, say, a high school calculus or pre-calculus and want to, to continue on with that subject matter so that it's still fresh. Um, we would certainly encourage students to do that. I think that what, what's going to be really important for you is really to sit down and think about what is it that you want to study? What subject? We, you don't have the full range of, of science subjects. And so really being selective and choosing what you're the most interested in. And, and I, I certainly know um, as well that I would encourage you to keep, just keep this in mind. Um, once you start your classes, there are certain dates by which you, you can make changes. So early in September, if you're in a class and you're thinking, wow, this is really not the class that's fitting right with my schedule. I registered for chemistry, but I'm not that interested. I'd really rather be taking this biology class. Then there is some flexibility and freedom for you to be able to move around and make sure that you're in the classes that are right for you. Go through the course syllabus or the description of what the expectations are within each course and really try and structure your program to a program that's, that fits to your learning style and what's gonna be best for you in the environment that you're learning. Um, that's great, yeah, and I'll just add to that that um, again, I'll put in another pitch for talking to an academic advisor, which I always think is a great idea. Uh, there are often courses that are required to happen at the first year level in order to be able to move on to a second year level. So the term we use for that is a prerequisite course. Um, and we, make our academic calendar, which lists in it every prerequisite and what's required for every program. But I will admit, I find academic calendars can be a little bit complicated to read and understand when you sit down with them. And that's exactly why uh, we have academic advisors available to support you so that you don't need to navigate all of those prerequisites solo. Um, there's another question here asking, uh, when will this year's FIP reading list be available? And will it show which readings the science students will miss? So the ones that would be kind of the Thursday lectures. Right. So uh, we are actually right at this very moment, uh, just uh, finishing compiling the reading list. And so it's going to be sent out very shortly. Uh, and actually we're hoping to send it out, not just electronically, but uh, get a paper version in your hands. I think that's the goal, isn't it, Yolanda? Um, and uh, so uh, that should be there in, I'm hoping a few days, uh, maybe a week uh, ish, miss. Uh, um, but uh, so, so very soon. Uh, and the usual way we've indicated Thursday reading, so the ones you're not responsible for, is by putting an asterisk uh, beside it. Uh, but there'll be some way to indicate 
uh, the Thursday readings, and those are the ones you don't have to do, and all the rest are going to be the ones that uh, you are responsible for. Uh, I think it's pretty clear. And again, if you ever have any questions, just contact the Foundation Program Office, and uh, your questions will be answered. We'd be delighted. Yeah, and I'm going to just say this follow-up because I get asked this question all the time by students who are super keen and very impressive, but frequently science students will ask me, can I do the Thursday readings if I want to? And the answer is, of course, yes, you can do them. That's awesome. Um, what we really mean is that you're not responsible for them, so you won't be asked questions about them in a midterm exam or, or in an oral exam situation, but you can absolutely do them. Um, there's a great question here uh, asking if doing foundation year program would affect a student's ability to take non-science related electives later on in their program through second, third, and fourth year. Um, and I think this is a fantastic question. I Would either of you like to take it or do you want me to? That sounds like a registrar or that's sure. beyond me. Okay, I, um, great question. So the, just to repeat, it's just doing FIP affect my ability to take non-science related electives in later years? And the short answer is no, uh, you can absolutely continue to take classes in subjects like arts, humanities, social sciences throughout the rest of your degree. Um, one really cool way to do that, for example, would be by doing a double major, or combined major, or mixing a major and a minor. So let's say you are a BSc student, a science student, and your major is going to be chemistry, for instance, that would not stop you from doing a combined honors degree with chemistry as your main subject and something from the humanities side, such as contemporary studies or history of science and technology as uh, your secondary subject, or making uh, adding a minor into your degree that's not in a science subject, a minor like um, international development studies, indigenous studies, law, justice, and society. So mixing arts and humanities is definitely a thing you can do while still working towards your Bachelor of Science degree. Um, it's really just a matter of which area of focus is going to be your primary area of focus. And I will say to the student who asked this question, um, if you are thinking about ways to mix and match sciences and humanities, kudos to you. That is an awesome thing to do. Some of the uh, coolest, smartest people I met at King's were the people who are mixing uh, a science degree and a humanities degree um, to kind of combine uh, and blend those. So yeah, no, FIP will not stop you from doing anything you wanna do with your science degree. Um, okay, do we know when the reading list will be available? We address that. There's a question here that says, I have not applied to residence yet because of COVID. Should I be doing this even though we will likely not be on campus? Um, yes, to the person who answered that question, you, you should apply for residence if you think you would like to have a spot in residence, uh, providing that we're able to make spaces in residence available to our students. Just to, so you know, we sent a message out um, this weekend uh, from our Dean of Students, who is the person who oversees residences at, at King's, uh, Katie Merwin. And you can read that statement from the Dean on our website. Uh, and if you can't find it, email me after this webinar and I'll send it to you directly. But basically what we say in that message is that it is a good idea to apply for residence now um, or as soon as possible. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to make rooms on our campus available to students. And if we don't have an application form for you, then there's no way for us to know that you want one of those rooms. Um, so it is a good idea to apply. Uh, if we are not able to offer you a room in our residences because of the uh, COVID-19 response on our campus, then we'll be returning or, or we'll, we'll take the $400 room confirmation fee that you pay and apply it, credit it to your tuition. So it's not going to be just lost, um, if that makes any sense. So if you have questions for me about the residence stuff, we'll, we can talk more outside of the context of this webinar. Um, but the short answer is definitely apply if, you, if you'd like to. Uh, okay. I'm not seeing any other questions pop into the Q&A just yet. I'm going to give it uh, two more minutes just in case there are any others that kind of pop in. Um, while we're waiting, just a few kind of next steps and things to be aware of. Um, I mentioned this earlier, course registration, June 15th. Uh, if you'd like to talk to an academic advisor before course registration, during course registration, after course registration, uh, email our academic services team at registrar 
at ukings.ca. And then you know, your email goes directly to our two in-house academic advisors, Julia and Kirsten, uh, or our peer advisors like Antoinette and Mia, and they'll triage those questions and answer them directly. Uh, and if you want to make a, an appointment to talk to one of the advisors, you might get really lucky. You might get to have a, a FaceTime appointment with uh, Julia and get to meet her awesome dog, Fast Eddie, which would be rad. Um, so totally worth it. And I also just wanted to mention, this is not um, something that the King's administration started. It's something that a bunch of students started, but I think it's really cool. So I wanted to put it in this PowerPoint. If you are an incoming FIP student and you'd like to get to know other incoming FIP students, uh, the incoming class, the class of 2024, have started um, some social media groups of their very own. They have a Facebook group that you can find at University of King's College 2024. Or you can find them on Instagram at UKings2024. And lately they've been sharing uh, photos and info about themselves and getting to know each other online. And that's awesome. So um, highly recommend, big shout out to whichever amazing students it was that started those two groups. You guys rock. <laughs>